blue and red, magenta, M A G E N T A. It's a purple. Welcome to the Doc Show. I'm Doc, and today we're going to have some fun with science. We're going to be talking about lenses, rainbows, sun dogs, and some wave action with a spring, some reflections with a curved mirror, and some magic tricks. I hope you enjoy the show. These are the Fresnel lenses. You know where they press them out? A Fresnel lens is a compact lens originally developed for lighthouses. They are flat on one side and ridged on the other. You can tell, you can tell what this is. If your hand, if you get baby face effect, it's diverging, all right? Because, you know, baby face diverging, all right? If a lens is diverging, it takes parallel rays and bends them so that they spread out. If you've got big face, it's the magnifying glass. It's converging. A converging lens refracts parallel light rays towards a point. All right, so what do you got there? Baby face or large? What do you got there? Baby face. Baby face. Diverging, all right? What do you got there? Baby face. These are nice. Put them in like your van and you can see a lot of things, all right? Big face or baby face? Big face. Magnifying glass, all right? Is it? Are you sure? Baby, baby face. Yeah, it's baby face. It is baby face. See, I check on my hand because I can't see my face, all right? Because I got to trust you. But I, but then, as a scientist, I trust no one. So, you know, I want to do it myself. I want to see your baby face. All right? So, this is cool. This is like, you know, a mat for like eating dinner. You know, Fresnel lens. You know, he pressed it out. Very nice. Hello, I'm here with Keely, and we're going to do some demonstrations for you. First thing I'm going to do is show you some neat reflections from a curved mirror. Now check this out. Watch how that ball looks like it's coming out and hitting you in the face. Depending on where that ball is, we get different kinds of images. A curved mirror is fascinating. And as we move back and forth through different positions, those different images have different sizes and it creates the illusion that it's coming out right at you, that ball, back and forth. Let's move on to some wave action. Baby slinky. There are two basic types of waves. One is your transverse wave, where we do sideways wiggling, like this. And your other type of wave is a longitudinal wave, where we compress or stretch. And we see a little ripple compression move from one hand to the other. This is like sound moving through air. The air moves back and forth as the sound waves travel. In contrast to the transverse wave, which is a sideways kind of motion. We're going to demonstrate the transverse wave, which is important for studying violin strings and guitar strings, with this spring. And Keely here is going to help me. So Keely, take one end there. All right, I'll take this All right, in. and we can say come a little closer here. Be good. Okay. And I'm going to take this other end, and we're making a little model of a violin or a guitar string. You back up just slightly. Yeah, that's great. And Keely, why don't you wiggle that a little bit and see what happens. This is the fundamental mode, the simplest mode of vibration on a string. Hmm. And when you play a guitar or a violin, most of the vibration is in this form, and that's the tone that you're going to hear. 
However, other vibrations are superimposed, and this gives us different colors for the different instruments, like a cello or the violin. Here we have to wiggle a little faster. Try that a little faster, Whitley. Go ahead, go for it, Gilly. Faster, you can do it. Now, this is challenging when the string is short because the frequency has to be higher. Try doubling your string. There, there you go. She's on the sum. <laughs> She's on the sum. That's good. Excellent. See, that's the second mode. There are two half waves, a crest or a trough, and they take turns going back and forth. And there are more and more waves as you go faster and faster. Let's look at the production of the waves in a toy called the Twirlatune. In the previous experiment, you couldn't hear the sound because if I take my hand and go back and forth, once a second or twice a second, once a second or twice a second, you're not going to hear that. You have to go like about 20 times a second, which a human can't do. In this case, we're going to get sounds. We're not going to be able to see the vibrations, but we're going to be able to hear the tones of the various modes of vibration that are natural to this pipe. And we're going to do this with Keely spinning it around. Oh, that's an interesting sound. Now, Keely, try, try spinning it a little faster and see what happens and see if you can get a different pitch. Yes, Whoa. that is very good. Yes, yes, nice, marvelous, marvelous, excellent, excellent. Here are some tubes called boom whackers, and what these do, when you whack them, you get a tone based on the length of the pipe. Right? Now that's do tuned to the C, like on the piano. And we're going to give Healy here re. All right. Now let's see. You can you can smack me, Healy. I don't want you to hurt your head. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah. Do re. That's very, very good. Now let's try doing do, re, me. I have here the me, so we have the do. I'll hit the do, Keely will then do the re, and then I'll do the me. Yeah. Do, re, once again. Yeah. Now we can actually study these pipes in more detail. We could do a laboratory experiment, you know, where we do measurements, and if you measure this, this length here, this length and compare to this, the, to go from do to me is about five to four ratio. So you know, there's a lot of rich physics in these pipes. Let's try the octave. This is the other do. If you go do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, makes a pleasant sound. Bum, bum. By the way, that's the song like somewhere over the rainbow. Now, if you back up uh, here and do uh, something that's not quite the end, the do, this is T. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. T is not quite nice compared to the resolution that comes with the do. Let's try the T. Yeah, see? Bum, bum. See? That really wants this at the end. See? Another do. Hmm. Very nice, Keely. Interesting. Thank you very much. And now for persistence of vision, I'm going to let Keely take this device, and as she presses the button, lights are going to come on and they're going to spin, and because our eye and brain working together, we remember for a split second what the image is, it gets to be continuous. This is how movies work, where they show different images quickly in front of your eye, and then it appears to be continuous. Go for it, Keely. Whoa. I think I had something like this when I was a kid. That's hmm. nice. Very good. Persistence of vision. Lots of fun. Persistence of vision. If I move my hand real quick, you may see some blur going on there. Same idea. All right, well, one last uh, demonstration here. I'll do a magic trick for you. All right? And this one, 
This one involves previous knowledge, we're gonna fool you, previous knowledge of like dominoes and patterns. Here you see two dots, so you're led to believe there could be three there, all right? And then if I show you here, like that's the six, and then I show you a one, and then I show you here a four. Now see, what's happening here is that there really are five dots. And by, and by, and by covering one of the dots, like here we have like two, by covering one of the dots, I can make it appear to be one, or I can make it appear to be three, you see? And this way, I'm showing you to three, and if I come around the other side, and cover the blank space, I'm then leading you to believe that that's a six. And then here, I cover this one, it's gonna be the one. And then when I come back here and cover this one, then it's gonna be the four. So you're thinking like they're changing, like from different numbers, but really I'm covering one versus the other so that you're thinking that they're changing, but they're really not, see? But sometimes magic does happen. All right, we have that. Wait, wait, the six, it's, real, it's really an eight. It, it, it's really an eight, that's what it is. Now that's magic. Wow. Hey, hey kid. Mm-hmm. What are you doing up in the clouds, kid? Uh, I don't know. Hey, what's that thing over there? Hmm? Over there, coming out of the top of the sun. I don't know. Well, I know. It's called a sun pillar. Oh. <laughs> yep. And do you know what causes it? Mm-mm. It's caused by the ice crystals floating in the air. Can't you see them? They're floating all around you. Light from the sun gets reflected off of the bottom of these ice crystals, and when it reaches your eyes, it looks like the light is coming from above the sun. And since it does this off of so many ice crystals, it looks like a pillar of light shooting up out of the sun. How neat is that? Wow! I know, right? Pretty freaking neat. Oh hey, do you see that other thing? Hmm? Yeah, look next to the sun. You see that thing that looks like a smaller sun? Mm-hmm. Well, they call that a sun dog, you know, because it's like a little companion that follows the sun wherever it goes. Hmm. Sun dogs are also caused by ice crystals, but this time it involves refraction and not reflection. As light from the sun passes through these ice crystals, it slows down. This causes the light to bend or refract. So when it reaches your eye, it looks like the light came from next to the sun. Whoa. I know, right? Now, kid, how's about we get you down from these clouds and take you home? Your parents must be worried sick. Eh, okay. There is the cup of coffee that's really at the end of the rainbow. Notice the red is on top and the blue violet end is on the bottom. We would like to understand why that's the case. And that brings us to what's called dispersion it's re, as a result of refraction where light enters the prism, that the light refracts, it bends to different degrees depending on the color. Here, you can remember the rule that the violet bends the most. I usually refer to that end of the rainbow spectrum as the blue end. Blue bends more, red bends less. And all the other colors are in between. If you read from top to bottom, you can think of Roy G. Bibb. You know, red, orange, yellow, green, and then blue, indigo, and violet. Here is a schematic of light coming into a droplet and the light will bend toward downward when it enters the droplet. Some of the light reflects up, we're not showing that because that's not relevant for us. And then the light goes to the back of the raindrop and then it will reflect down. Some of the light will escape the raindrop, but the light that comes down and eventually out, the colors spread out. Now when you look at this, you'll see that the red is at the lower end and the violet is at the top end. And that's because the violet's bending more, it's a more dramatic effect, and the red is not bending as much. So what we're gonna see from that drop is actually the red. The other light will go over our head, and that's why the red will be on top. And the other colors, like the blue end, that has a, an angle that's higher, will see a droplet lower in the sky for that part of the arc, the blue arc. 
And when that gets into our eye, say here, or that's an example here of uh, light that's doing a lot of stuff going through the raindrop, and here that's not going to be relevant to us because that light that hits the middle of the raindrop is going to come you know, back out and be too, very, too, very high and won't be able to see it at all. So this is more like what we'll be able to see. And in these diagrams, the bending that we're showing and the spreading of the colors are exaggerated for purposes of illustration. So there's the red. And there's the blue, more dramatic, for the drop at the same height. And we're going to be able to see that red. And that blue is going to go over our head. So the blue goes over our head. We're going to see the, uh, the red. And the blue in the arc that we see is actually from droplets that are lower in the sky. And the angles go from about 40 to 42 degrees. And you see all the colors in between. Very beautiful. And there's our primary rainbow. When we look at the double rainbow, this is a fainter rainbow because what's happening is in the drop, you get two reflections, and with the two reflections, the light is then is not as intense. And here, when you do the two uh, reflections inside, since blue is more dramatic than the red, the blue is actually need to be lower than the red when you do the uh, physics analysis, tracing the thing through. And therefore, the red's over your head, you're going to be seeing blue on the top. So that's why in the secondary rainbow, the colors are reversed. See? So and the primary rainbow, which you see there, the brighter one, the red's on top, and the violet ends on the bottom. And for the one that's not as bright, the secondary rainbow, due to the double reflection, you have the red on the bottom, and you have the blue on the top. Very nice. And here, beautiful. Say the two rainbows, primary and secondary rainbow. Very nice. <laughs>